So this is uh, joint work with both anonymous colleagues, individuals at the University of Colorado Boulder, the University of Maryland, UMass, V2Ray, as well as uh, some independent authors. So a little bit of background. We've heard this from a couple of previous speakers. There are many countries across the globe that censor their internet. Today we'll be primarily focused on China and the GFW. Now the censorship can be done in a variety of different ways, be it DNS injection, IP-based filtering, or deep packet inspection. And users try to get around this. Uh, they use a variety of different proxies, VPNs, and other methods. Um, as, as mentioned before, sometimes this is referred to ladders. Now, these governments try to block these proxies, um, and this has become a priority for them as these tools get more and more advanced. So we're gonna talk about two different types of, or two different protocols that are used in developing these proxies. The first of which is not fully encrypted. Um, they can use tunnels such as TLS, and then the second is gonna be fully encrypted traffic, which would, which would be protocols like OBS4, ShadowSox, or VMS. So with a protocol like TLS, while it does encrypt the, the bulk of the traffic, there's an unencrypted handshake that gives valuable information to the sensor. For example, SNI for TLS, which is essentially giving the sensor the domain name that the user is trying to access, and they can filter based off of this. However, for fully encrypted protocols like ShadowSox, starting with the very first packet, there is no unexposed handshake that the sensor can glean information off of. Now this makes it very difficult to come up with a one-size-fits-all rule for how to block this traffic. It has been vulnerable in the past to attacks such as active probing, but you can't just start filtering packets whenever you want. However, in November of 2021, users in China began to report shadow socks being blocked. They saw some connections get through with absolutely no trouble, while other connections would get blocked shortly after uh, the, the, the data packet started getting sent. And once a connection experienced blocking, any follow-up connections going to the same three-tuple would experience blocking on the TCP handshake. This residual censorship would occur for up to three minutes after that first connection. This begs the question of what's triggering this blocking. And so we set out to explore this. And to do that, we established a vantage point within China, as well as a server here in the US. We would establish a simple TCP connection and send random data across this, trying to isolate whether this had something to do with the traffic or the protocol. After sending a couple of these random data packets or in different connections, we would experience the same blocking, and we would experience the same residual censorship. This helped us identify that there was something deeper here that wasn't specific to any one protocol. So next we set out to identify how they were determining what was and wasn't random traffic. And to do this, we sent payloads with the same byte repeating, incrementing from 0, 1 up to FF hex. We found that for plenty of bytes, like 0, 1 and 0, 2, that we never experienced any blocking with those payloads. However, for payloads like 0F or 1.7, we would see this blocking very consistently. This leads us to the first finding, which was a crude entropy test being deployed by the sensor. Whereas if, all of the, if, if half the bits in the connection were set to zero and half set to one, this traffic would not be exempt to their blocking. And it was likely that if no other rules were met, then the traffic would get blocked. As we varied this payload, we found that there was a loose threshold around 50%. And as long as you were within that threshold, the traffic would experience blocking. However, we know of other protocols like TLS, that has traffic that is encrypted and shares these same characteristics. So the next thing we did was set out to understand why those protocols weren't getting blocked. This leads to protocol signatures, the first of which being HTTP. We found that if we prepended data or prepended our payload with, the, with a git space or post space common starts to HTTP requests, that the traffic also wouldn't experience any form of blocking. Now for TLS, it happened to be the same three bytes that start most common TLS connections. 
This exemption allows for these popular protocols to get by, even if they share some of the same characteristics as fully encrypted traffic. So as mentioned before, we weren't seeing this blocking with every single connection. It was as if this blocking was happening intermittently, or there was some mistake that had been made. However, when we tried to experiment with this, and use the same payload that we knew would get blocked, sending it repeatedly in multiple connections, we started to observe a pattern of blocking 26% of the time. So the next question is, why might they be doing this behavior? And ultimately, what we come up with is two explanations. One, they might be sampling the observed traffic. They might be only looking at 25% of all connections in order to reduce the computational load required. The second explanation could be reducing false positives. There is a world in which a protocol that's benign could start a connection every once in a while and fail to meet any of the rules that we identify. However, with a tool like ShadowSox, every single connection that gets made will fail these rules. And for a user conducting a normal browsing session with multiple connections, Reducing 25, cutting out 25% of their connections could be enough to deter them from continuing. So next we want to understand what IP addresses are affected. We did an internet-wide scan and found that 98% of all IP addresses don't experience this form of blocking at all. However, when we started to break down by autonomous system, we find slightly different results. We see that 95% of ASs have less than 10% of their IPs affected. And for a few ASs, over 30% of their IPs are affected. Interestingly, the affected ASs are all popular VPS providers such as DigitalOcean, Akamai, or AWS. Now, many of the operators of these circumvention tools host their services within these retail cloud providers, which might be an explanation as to why they were targeting these specific systems. So at this point, we've come up with a few ideas or rules that the sensor seems to be using to exempt this traffic. We know that if they exclude a certain threshold of zeros, that that traffic will get by. And if we have a certain amount of printable ASCII or start with certain characters, that those, that traffic will get by as well. We also know that they have a very basic fingerprint for some common protocols to ensure that that traffic doesn't experience any blocking. So next we set out to evaluate these rules and see how effective they are. And to do that, we use a university network tap and we start observing connections and labeling those connections with what rules the sensor would use to exempt the traffic. We ultimately find that about half a percent of this traffic does not match any of the rules set out by the sensor. And since this network that we're testing on doesn't experience any censorship, it's unlikely that these users would be utilizing the tools, and we can reasonably say that this is the false positive rate. Another interesting finding from this experiment was that 89% of traffic is exempt simply by matching TLS. This means that depending on how the sensor orders their rules when analyzing traffic, they can reduce the computational complexity by just checking the first three bytes of all connections first. So now to look at some mitigations into how sensors can uh, or how we as circumvention develop, tool developers can get around this type of blocking. In the short term, we can naively match exemptions. We can prepend traffic with um, protocols such as the bytes for TLS or HTTP. Though in the long term, we're gonna wanna modify the entropy of the payload. And we can do this by padding the payload with zeros or ones in order to exceed or go under that threshold that we've discussed. Sorry about that. So many circumvention tools have adopted these, these fixes. As far as entropy modification goes, we developed a, a version of the ShadowSox library that has successfully used this method to get around this blocking. As far as prepending traffic with prefixes, Outline, Lantern, and Siphon have started adding this to their products. 
as well as Shadow Socks Outline and V2 Ray starting their connections with printable ASCII. Now these tools have millions of users globally and we were able to adopt some of these fixes as quickly as two weeks after the blocking began. We also find that these fixes are still effective today. So the last question that we want to answer is why this blocking happened when it did. We know that the blocking began on November 6th of 2021, and just a few days later, the CCC began a somewhat controversial meeting. What I haven't mentioned yet is that on March 15th, 2023, when the USENIX Artifact Evaluation Committee tried to verify our results, they stopped blocking. <laughs> and to some extent discredited what we were trying to do. <laughs> but what we really find is that just days before that, Xi was reelected as president of China and had completed some of the political goals that he may have been trying to. And therefore, there was no need to continue this blocking. We know that in the past, censorship has revolved around these political events. And so we find that to be a reasonable explanation. However, some other explanations include it being economically expensive. The sensor is very sensitive to their false positive rate, and they might have found that half percent to just be intolerable. Additionally, it could be computationally expensive, and these resources were reallocated for other uses, such as other forms of censorship or other government tasks. So in conclusion, we've inferred these rules that the sensor is using to identify this fully encrypted traffic. And we've also inf inferred ways around it by simply padding as well as prepending different bytes. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>